Hello and welcome. Concrete is a long-running series written and illustrated by Paul Chadwick. The character first appeared in Dark Horse Presents No. 1 in 1986. For a number of years, Concrete was a regular staple of that anthology, making over 20 appearances. The character would get an ongoing series in 1987 that would only last 10 issues. From there, Concrete would appear in a variety of limited series. In other words, the history of Concrete is rather fractured and difficult to follow. Conveniently, the majority of his appearances are collected and published in eight different volumes. The first two volumes are a mix of the short stories from Dark Horse Presents and the longer single-issue stories from the ongoing series. The subsequent volumes are dedicated to miniseries and also include related short stories. So for anyone intrigued by the concept, Concrete's continuity is tightly pieced together in all the currently available volumes. While a fan of comics at an early age, Paul Chadwick didn't originally plan to become a comic book artist. As he said in a 1988 interview, quote, I went to the Art Center College of Design. I had decided to be an illustrator. I didn't want to go into comics at that point. This was before the creator's rights revolution and the higher salaries that came along with it. Comics wasn't an appealing profession. Unquote. In design school, one of Chadwick's teachers was Baron Story, a legendary illustrator whose influence can be seen in Bill Sienkiewicz's work. Chadwick himself admits Story had an influence on his evolving comic book style. He cites Dark Horse Presents No. 5 as being an example of that influence. Overall, one can see the graphic design background present in some of Chadwick's work. Much like American Flag, the design is adapted to the dimensions of a comic book page and the specific language used for the medium. It may be a single illustration in spirit, but it is designed in a manner that evokes the language of a comic book. Once out of school, Chadwick was a storyboard artist for such oddball movies as Strange Brew and Pee-wee's Big Adventure. This is an experience that certainly helped develop his visual skills in staging a scene. However, when it came to storyboarding, Chadwick stated, quote, Storyboards are a means to an end. I wanted to do some writing, and I also wanted to produce some artwork that had some value in itself. Unquote. With creators' rights being taken seriously by a variety of new publishing companies, such as First Comics, Pacific Comics, and Dark Horse, Chadwick decided it was time to try expressing the full range of his creativity. In fact, he pitched Concrete to First Comics in 1983. But, because he took an extended vacation shortly after submitting his proposal, he missed the letter of interest an editor had sent. By the time he returned from his vacation, First Comics had a full schedule and passed on the project. Chadwick then took penciling work on a very unexpected title. He illustrated the final issues of the original Dazzler series. While the work is competent, it certainly doesn't reach the same level as the forthcoming work for Concrete. Partially, this may be due to the inkers, and possibly, Chadwick may not have been fully invested in the project. It paid the rent, gained him experience, and nothing more. Chadwick returned to storyboarding while shopping the Concrete proposal around. Both Epic Comics and the newly formed Dark Horse were interested in publishing the series. However, Dark Horse wanted short stories for an anthology, which was not Chadwick's preferred format. Epic Comics was open to a series, but they wanted it to be a standard format title, with ads. Ultimately, the deciding factor was Dark Horse's creator-friendly attitude and the fact that, should Concrete become a series, they would allow Chadwick to do a back cover and the comic wouldn't need to include ads. With that, Concrete began its long association with Dark Horse Comics. Concrete is about Ron Lithgow, a former speechwriter trapped in an alien body. He's nearly invulnerable, quite strong, and his eyes are able to see great distances and to a microscopic depth. He can hold his breath for an hour and seems impervious to extreme weather conditions and fatigue. His internal temperature is so high, it actually boils water. He can eat anything, even rocks and wood. When he eats rocks, those somehow transmute and become part of his outer shell. The negative effect of this transformation is having no sense of taste or smell, and his sense of touch seems greatly diminished. He also has no sex organs, so that's not great. Finally, he lives in a world not designed for a seven-foot-tall mass of solid stone. Ron lives his life publicly. In fact, his origin and profile is manufactured by the government to cover up his true origin. 
Publicly, Ron is known as Concrete, the only working cyborg prototype of a failed experimental program. He goes on talk shows, does interviews, and there's a plethora of merchandise with his name on it. All of this is to normalize his presence and to eventually get the public apathetic to his existence. This way no one questions his true origin and they just accept he exists. Very few people know his real origin and his real name. These facts remain a closely guarded secret, although they are revealed to the reader. Ron's daily life is assisted by Larry Monroe, a writer who helps Ron do all the mundane things he cannot due to his size. And there's Dr. Maureen Vonnegut, a biologist who continually monitors Ron and attempts to understand his complex physiology. Other supporting characters do come and go as needed, but these three are the core members of the Concrete series. Early on, there's a great scene that establishes this triangle dynamic. While trying to swim the Atlantic, the boat they're on capsizes, and Larry, Maureen, and another individual spend weeks in a life raft trying to survive, while Ron tows them to safety. During this time, Larry and Maureen share a very human, intimate moment. Once rescued, Larry tries to tactfully address this encounter, but Maureen seems completely unaware of the subtext Larry is suggesting. A moment later, she's attempting the same tactic with Ron, seeing if he remembers anything about that moment. But Ron is unsure what she's alluding to. So it's a complex triangle of concern and compassion for one another, mixed with a good layer of denial or empathetic deception. Like any close relationship, this dynamic will evolve and change with time. But that's a good foundational scene that illustrates the complexities of how these three people interact. As for Concrete's origin, there are two versions. The first volume contains the original, somewhat shorter version of how Ron became Concrete. The sixth volume, Strange Armor, is a slightly modified, expanded version. According to the introduction to Strange Armor, Chadwick was never satisfied with the original version, mainly because it wasn't as grounded as he thought it should be. At some point, Concrete was optioned by an unspecified Hollywood studio. Chadwick worked with the screenwriter to adapt Concrete into a movie, and then did a few drafts himself. Allegedly, Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh also wrote a Concrete screenplay, which got the property a green light for a brief time. Unfortunately, Hollywood is fickle, and a film version was shelved. The video currently seen on screen is apparently test footage shot in 2001. However, I could not confirm its validity. Regardless, the origin was reworked for the screenplay, and Chadwick used some of the ideas to create strange armor. Unlike the original version, the time Ron spends with the aliens that transform him is severely reduced. The majority of strange armor focuses on Ron's time with the NSA while they determine what he has become. It fleshes out his relationship with Maureen Vonnegut and brings into focus what Ron endured while being a reluctant guest of the government. Of the two, in my opinion, the first version is perfectly fine and works much better. The second does read like an adapted screenplay, with a subplot or two that is somewhat melodramatic. It's not terrible, but in relation to the original version, it's not as concise or subtle. To be perfectly honest, the horror of Ron's time with the aliens is practically non-existent. It's very bare bones, with the major beats briefly highlighted. It comes off like a budget-conscious version, written to attract a studio. When asked to elaborate on the premise of Concrete, Jedwick stated, quote, Basically, Concrete is me mulling over what I might do if I wasn't susceptible to harm, had nearly no needs, and therefore few monetary responsibilities, wasn't afraid of so many things, and wasn't distracted by sex. Unquote. As a character and premise description, that is rather accurate. Concrete's defining theme is an examination of this hulking, monstrous entity living the best life he can under the circumstances he's been given. There are no superhero battles, or alien invasions, that Concrete has to repel. He doesn't put on a costume, wander the streets of a city, and make sure all right-minded citizens stay safe. Concrete is a grounded examination of what it would be like to find yourself locked inside an indestructible stone shell, completely divorced from everything that defined you as a human being. All your senses are altered or non-existent. Your actual experience of life has become, quite literally, alien to your own mind. Through this process of adaptation, especially in moments of silence, Ron explores a somewhat objective detachment from the human experience. Naturally, he feels a fair amount of alienation. 
but this detachment and alienation highlight the incredible opportunity one experiences being an alert, sentient being, which is a quality that is usually taken for granted by the alert, sentient beings of Earth. While the stories can be seen as hopeful and uplifting, that feeling is contrasted with an underlying darkness. Many of the adventures Ron pursues are not just difficult, but potentially life-threatening. Even in a strong, nearly indestructible shell, Ron does have his limitations. And sometimes, it's like Ron is not just being foolhardy, but actively seeking to put himself in situations that might be fatal, especially early on, when he's adapting to his new life. Continuing with darkness, many of the people who Ron helps do have a dark secret they've carefully hidden. Through his involvement, that secret is eventually revealed, and Ron finds himself making morally questionable but understandable decisions. Finally, Ron's preoccupation with erotica, specifically female nudes that bear a resemblance to women he knows, is an interesting character beat. It suggests Ron acknowledges that he'll never again experience that type of physical intimacy. In response, he collects the women he'll never attain. Admittedly, this is something that's very open to interpretation, but to me, it seems like a passive-aggressive expression of desire or lust. So, it's easy to read the series as a life-affirming or charming examination about the wonders of our environment. But there is a dark, unspoken, existential ordeal under the surface. Environmental and social concerns begin as subtext in the early stories. These concerns become more obvious at certain points. Overall, it's handled well, and with few exceptions, such as Think Like a Mountain and The Human Dilemma, it doesn't read as an obvious attempt to solve a specific problem. To be transparent, I only reread the first four volumes and the new origin in the sixth for this overview. The other volumes are fine, but quite honestly, I wasn't in the mood for the type of stories they represent, so I skipped them. Paul Chadwick's artwork is consistently good throughout the series. The only point where it's noticeably different is in the third volume, Fragile Creature, the artwork is rather flat, with hardly any variation in line work, and barely any shading or shadows. But to be fair, the story was originally done in color, which provided the depth, and the reprints are strictly black and white. So that accounts for the stripped-down style, and why it looks so different. In the end, Concrete is rather unique. It's surprisingly understated and grounded, especially for a series where the lead character is prime material for outrageous adventure stories. Instead, it's a look at humanity through the eyes of someone who's literally lost all the features that define a human being. All he's retained is his mind and his perceptions. It wouldn't be accurate to state concrete is about one thing specifically, but it also wouldn't be inaccurate to state it's about the human experience. It's about the depth of life that carries on all around us, mostly hidden from view. At times, it's a touch idealistic, but it's also grounded in reality. It recognizes that life is far too complicated to simplify into easy or condescending sound bites. Thank you for watching or listening, whatever the case may be. And I'd like to thank the individual or individuals that requested a look at Concrete. It was a suggestion that I saw pop up in the comments quite a lot over the last few months. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and a comment. That helps this channel out and is a fine way of showing support for scripted, measured content like this. If you want to go a step further with your support, there's a link to my Patreon down below. Some exclusive, quick reviews of more recent material will be coming soon. I actually have one recorded and ready to be edited, so there's some incentive to join up. Additional thanks to all my fine supporters on YouTube and Patreon. I appreciate every single one of you. Extra special thanks to Andrew Barton, Odin Ashcroft, Phil Sagan, Corey Drew, Ellis Greger, Alexa Zernish, Brian Deaton, Johnny Lim, Steve White, Taylor Dull, and Matt Marino. You are all justified and ancient. Hey look, a playlist. Check it out for a variety of fine video products. Until next time.